did I tell you about my albatross? Hey yo, here we go. Come on. Welcome to another episode of Did I Tell You About My Albatross? I'm your host, Albie. This is the golf podcast for honest degenerates. It's like teaming up with your favorite foursome every week and diving into the best stories in and around golf. You guys ready to tee off? Let's go. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Did I Tell You About My Albatross? I'm your host, Albie. And boy, do I have a good one for you tonight. This is a bonus episode I'm dropping right before Halloween. You'll notice I'm flying solo here. There's no shepherd. There's no panda. It's just your boy, Alby. And I've got a really special episode because, man, I love Halloween, okay? And I'll tell you why here in just a second. But today I'm going to be diving into the chilling tales of the most haunted courses in North America. We're going to be unraveling some of the darkest secrets and worst ways to meet your demise on a golf course. I mean, some of these are gruesome, okay? I'll just be gun and tell you. And then also touching on some spine-tingling, mob-related mysteries on the links. If there is one genre of true crime that I just love, it's it's mob. It's it's the mob stuff. I just love it. So we're going to be diving into all of it because there's a lot related to, to the world of golf, in and around golf, and that's what we're all about here at Did I Tell You About My Albatross. Now, before we dive in, let me share my personal experience because I feel I have a connection to this other world, okay, this other dimension, that um, that has been strange for probably the last 16, 17 years, okay? Something crazy happened to me. So my it all started in 2005, 2006, somewhere in that range, and we, we went on a family trip. I went with my sister and my mom. We went to Amelia Island, Florida, okay? And so we're there with my, my brother-in-law, my mom, my sister, and my little nephew. Now, I wanted, at the time, I wanted the absolute best ghost tour possible, okay? What is What do the locals call the best ghost tour? Because even if you go there to in today's world, ghost tours are a thing in Amelia Island. They're also a thing in St. Augustine, which is right by there as well. But I wanted the real deal. I wanted the best of the best. Man, did the locals deliver? Because I'm still not right from this thing, okay? So we go on this ghost tour. We tour the downtown area. Crazy story after crazy story. The narrator was fantastic, Scared out of my mind. We end the tour in the cemetery. It's late at night. Fog's rolling in. It's spooky. I mean, it is straight out of a movie, like, horror set. It's crazy. So I grab my camera, and as she's telling the stories, I'm taking pictures on my digital camera of the cemetery. And what was shocking was after I would take a picture, dozens of these little green spheres orbs would show up in all of the pictures in every single picture at the cemetery as soon as i left the cemetery and even before the cemetery these orbs did not show up at all ever now i thought it may be the camera i thought it may be the lighting or dust or something like that but no other cameras that anyone else had there had these okay and then the other crazy part is that it still happens to this day it doesn't matter what camera i'm using It doesn't matter what time of day it is. These orbs have followed me since. I kid you not on this. This sounds crazy. I sound like a lunatic. I'm probably going to lose some listeners on this. But it's. I'm telling you right now, not all of them, but it's interesting how often it happens even still to this day. I can give you a couple of examples. Now, what's interesting, too, about the story is that the following day, my sister, mom, and the whole family and I, we, we go out to eat breakfast, right? We're eating breakfast. I'm showing my mom, my sister, my brother-in-law the pictures. And someone overheard us. And this lady walks up to us and says, hey, excuse me, my, my name's Maggie. I'm an author, and I'm actually doing a book on Ghosts of Amelia Island. Do you mind if, I, I, I'm i sorry, but I overheard what you had said. Do you mind if I take a look at the pictures? She looked at him and she said, oh my gosh, these would be great for the book I'm writing. Would you mind if I if I put them in the book? And I said, no, of course not. So she grabbed my number. Sure enough, I'll put the link here in the description where you can actually buy the book on Amazon. Shout out to Maggie. <laughs> she put she used the picture. But right there on the cover, you'll see these orbs. It's crazy. So let me give you a couple more quick examples, and then I'll get into the spooky stuff here around around golf. Um, let me let me share what what else happened. So a few years later, right? I'm at my bungalow, and I, I had a bungalow, rented a bungalow with my now wife, then girlfriend. And we are in Orlando. And one evening, randomly, middle of the night, I'd probably say like 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, we had two big dogs. 
Rhodesian Ridgeback and Weimaraner, they jump down off the couch simultaneously, and they both dive for what seemed to be the air. Like, there was nothing there. They go crazy. They were barking. They were biting at it. They were literally going insane over, again, what seemed to be nothing. Like, there was nothing there. So I go under the, um, you know, again, it's a bungalow. So I go under the crawl space, or I shine a light under the crawl space. I go outside, look, there was nothing there, okay? They're also, they're just, they keep going crazy. So we couldn't calm them down. I grab, I grab a camera and take a picture, and there is an orb the size of, if you would take, if you would take like maybe seven or eight beach balls and combine them and put them into one, that's how big this orb was. I'd say like maybe four feet in diameter. I mean, it was huge, massive. And it was just hovering. And it was right in the spot where the dogs were going crazy barking. So fast forward. So you're probably wondering, okay, what is in the world does this have to do with a golf podcast, Albie? And let me let me try to tie all this together, okay? So, you know, my father introduced my father introduced me to golf in North Carolina. Anyone who listens to the podcast knows I'm from North Carolina. Knows I always give a shout out to Chris Paul. Shout out CP3. I see you out there. And um, and so anyway, my dad's the one that taught me golf, right? He he introduced me to the game. We didn't have a chance to play together very often. He passed away, unfortunately, before I really appreciated the game and took it serious. But it's something that I still share with him because, again, he's the one that introduced me to it. And I know how passionate he was about the game. So we lived right next to Tanglewood, a golf course in in North Carolina. And my father and I would jump the fence a lot in the evenings. Sorry, Tanglewood, about that. But we would jump the fence in the evenings and go play a few holes, right? So it's just something that I, I will always remember about my dad. It's something that I share. So what's interesting about that night with the dogs barking and going crazy in the huge orb was my sister reminded me when I told her that story that Oh, well, you know, that was the anniversary of when dad passed away. So that was kind of crazy. And then whenever I'm on the golf course, I always think of my dad, especially if I'm playing like a really nice course or maybe a unique experience on a golf course, whether it's a good shot. Like I said, unique doesn't happen very often, but maybe there's just something. And a lot of times I'll send a thought or a prayer, whatever you want to call it, to my dad. And that happened during when I hit the albatross. Okay. So I know a lot of eye rolls here when I tell this story, but the, when I hit my albatross, you know, it was sort of bittersweet because I wasn't able to share that with my dad. And I thought about it right after it happened. I don't tell this part of the story very often. I certainly tell the, the rest of the story as often as I possibly can, but I don't tell this piece because people think I'm an absolute lunatic. But when I go in and turn the scorecard in again, thinking of my dad, bittersweet, they write the scores on a dry erase board, when they write down the scores, I take a picture of it. I actually take several pictures. And in one of the pictures, there's a green orb hovering right above the scoreboard. I don't even know what all that means, right? All I know is that I'm open-minded, okay? I'm open-minded to this other dimension, to other things. I don't know what's out there, right? I'm not saying I do, but I'm just saying I'm open-minded. So, Let's get started. Let's jump into some of these spooky stories. Now, here's my warning. Some of these are pretty gruesome. So if you want to bow out now, by all means, I won't hold it against you. Completely get it. One of the first years where I joined Carrollwood here in Tampa, we were getting ready to tee off for the Saturday men's game. I think it was Saturday or Sunday men's game, right? And my buddy and I hop in the cart and the club pro, we were one of the first ones out. My club, the, the club pro comes down. It's like, hey guys, come here a second pulls us over and says, hey, I wanted to let you know that you may see a police car or you may see an ambulance. And that is because one of the maintenance folks found a man hanging from a tree earlier this morning. And we had to call, we obviously had to call authorities. It, you know, all signs point to the fact that he took his own life. And it's eerie. Like, this tree's still there. It's one of the oldest trees at our course. And I don't know much about it. I tried even looking at the story up, but I could share it on here. I couldn't even find it in any of the records here in Hillsborough County. But um, but it's true. I mean, I verified it with even the maintenance gentleman that that found him. But, um, but yeah, very, I mean, it's just kind of, kind of eerie. Whenever we play that hole and we go by that tree, it's obviously all I can think about. You can almost feel it. So... This one's called Murders on the Fairway. 
Ghosts aren't the only things that haunt the fairways. There are also tales of true crime that have left their mark on the golfing world. In 2013, a horrific scene unfolded at the exclusive Pine Tree Golf Club in Florida, where a club member was found beaten to death with a golf club. The murder weapon? His own putter. The case is still unsolved to this day, and there really is not that much information on it other than the fact that this guy was beaten and bludgeoned to death by his putter. City Park, New Orleans, Louisiana. According to local legend, in the 1960s, a man shot and killed a woman, finishing her round of golf on the 18th hole. Since then, many golfers supposedly have heard the sound of a gunshot and a chilling woman scream. Allegedly, golfers have gone as far as calling 911 to report their experience. While historical evidence of any original murder has yet to be found, reports of City Park's haunts continue to surface even to this day. Now, while currently closed, the Etna Springs Golf Course is supposedly the final resting place of eight 16th century monks believed to be tortured to death by rival Spaniards. These monks alleged to wander the course in their translucent white robes and shaven heads. In 1963, a doctor playing the course snapped a photo, which I will post in the description, of the monks. Perhaps the lack of golfers on the premise lately has increased the spectral activity. You can see in this picture, I mean, it looks like a ghost. It's just a ghost. I mean, I don't know what else to describe. It's white. It's kind of floating around. Take a look at the picture on our on our description. It's kind of crazy. Now, tucked away under a large cottonwood tree in Montgomery, Minnesota, the first hole of Montgomery National Golf Club, there are two gravestones of the original settlers of the property. One of these settlers supposedly strolls the course in his hat and overalls. His apparition is seen by golfers in the early morning light. Additionally, one of the golf club's deceased founders is said to still be checking in on the course. His pale face is often peering into windows. Now, in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, one winter in the 1880s, Catherine Sutter traveled through Fort Leavenworth with her two children. Her children mysteriously disappeared one night. Some say they were cared for by local Native Americans, while others say they were killed. Either way, the legend says that Catherine spent the remainder of the winter desperately searching for her children. Ultimately, she would succumb to an illness brought on by the exposure. Today, she has claimed to be seen at night searching the grounds of Trail West for her loved ones. People claim to see a lone lantern floating through the golf course. Now, the Garrison in Garrison, New York, located in the same valley as the legend of Sleepy Hollow, this course already is unnerving. However, when a 19th century graveyard overlooks the 14th green, there is definitely an eeriness that cannot be avoided. Therefore, it is no surprise that golfers have reported strange happenings on the course. If you ever find yourself teeing off the Garrison golf course, be sure to watch your surroundings. You never know what you may be lurking in the woods. So this is a story from Arizona, Trilogy Golf Club. The spirits that haunt this course are different than those on the list before. Okay, they're believed to be related to Native Americans that once resided in this area. Strange winds patterns can be seen while playing the course. Whirlwinds move in irregular and bizarre ways. Native Americans in that area refer to them as restless spirits. And perhaps these desert winds, often seen on the golf course, are spirits who met an untimely demise in the area's bloody history. Now, Lincoln Park, San Francisco, California. I'll put this picture on, on, the, uh, on our description as well. Now, this course was not built near a cemetery. It was built on a cemetery. Officially, the cemetery is said to have been relocated in 1909. However... The 18th hole is said to be built on top of an unremoved portion of the old Golden Gate Cemetery. That would make this course home to over 1,000 corpses. Definitely something to keep in mind as you hit off the 18th tee box. Golfers have been known to report golf balls vanishing or being struck from the air by mysterious forces. And then in Victoria Golf Club, Victoria, British Columbia, the beautiful Canadian golf course is over 125 years old. However, its past is not as innocent as its beauty. In 1936, Dorius Gravelin had a meeting one night out on the course with her estranged husband. 
What exactly transpired is still unknown. Her body would be discovered by a caddy five days later along the shoreline of the course. A month later, the body of her husband would be discovered by a fisherman near the course as well. Today, the event is believed to have been a murder-suicide. However, what exactly transpired that infamous night will never be fully known. Today, nearly everyone who visits the course, even the general manager, claims to have experienced the restless ghost of Doris Gravelin. There are many sightings of Doris all around the property in the same white gown she died in. Even the security cameras have supposedly caught evidence of her presence on the course. It seems no solo golfers really play Victoria Club alone. Each year, an estimated 40,000 golfers seek emergency treatment due to the injuries caused by errant golf balls and flying club heads. This is a question that we bring up on the podcast all the time. Why aren't there more people injured in golf? And so that's a crazy stat to me, like 40,000 golfers, okay? So lightning strikes accounted for deaths of nine golfers over a 10-year stretch. So lightning is obviously a huge concern, but it's only killing nine people. There's over 15,000 injuries a year from golf carts. These are the top 10, in my opinion, terrible ways to die. I mean, it's never good to die on a golf course, but these are these are probably the worst ways you can do it. Number one, the man in Ireland was searching for his ball in a ditch when a rat ran up his leg, urinated, and bit him. The man finishes his round despite suffering the bite. He died two weeks later from kidney failure, a symptom of Wells disease, which is carried by rats. Number two, a man left a Virginia country club with a headache, which was compounded by fever, nausea, and a rash. Four days later, he was in the hospital covered with blisters and died from a severe allergic reaction to a pesticide used on the course. Number three, in another toxic incident, a teenager from Arizona died after drinking from a golf course water cooler. He contracted a norovirus from water that was contaminated. Bring your own water, man. Bring your own water to the course. Number four, after a poor shot on a New York golf course, a teenager slammed his three wood against a bench. The club snapped and a piece was propelled back towards him and pierced his heart. There were doctors on the course who attempted to save him before he was taken to the hospital and pronounced dead. He was the second golfer we found who was killed by the shaft of one of his clubs. Another died when his driver broke during a swing and part of the shaft pierced an artery in his groin, causing him to bleed to death. Ooh. Number five. In California, an 83-year-old celebrated his 18th hole-in-one only to die from an aneurysm moments after his scorecard had been verified. Number six. In Canada, a golfer died on the course after his cart hit a retaining wall and tumbled 20 feet to the road below. The death was ruled accidental, though the coroner noted that the man's blood alcohol level was twice the legal limit. Number seven, during a round with her family in Japan, a woman drowned after falling into a sinkhole that formed in the middle of the fairway. The water-filled hole was about 15 feet deep, five feet wide, and was said to be caused by a runoff that made the turf collapse. Number eight, a fight between a golfer and the threesome playing behind him turned deadly when a man was fatally kicked in the chest. The argument stemmed from the threesome losing their patience, waiting on the guy to search for a lost ball. A jury ruled that the kick was an act of self-defense. Number nine. After his round, a man was searching for his balls in a South African dam when he was attacked by a crocodile and disappeared into the water. His body was found the next morning without mutilation, but with a few teeth marks. Park rangers killed the 12-foot reptile. Number 10, a man in Australia died after a large branch broke off a tree and struck him while he was waiting to tee off. He suffered several injuries that contributed to his death six days later. So let's get into the mob stuff. There's an article that recaps, and I'll put all of the I'll put all of our references in in the in the links in in our description. So there's an article that recaps the murder of Boston mob boss James Whitey Bulger and reflects on his connections to a previous crime, the 1981 murder of a Tulsa businessman, Roger Wheeler. On the morning of October 30th, 2018, James Whitey Bulger was found dead in his cell at U.S. Penitentiary Hazleton. Just four hours after being transferred there, his face was badly beaten, and it was believed to be attacked with a padlock wrapped in a sock. 
No one has been charged with this murder. Bolger had been on the run for over 16 years before his arrest in 2011. He was convicted in 2013 of numerous killings and sentenced to two consecutive life sentences. One of the murders he was convicted for was the killing in 1981 of Roger Wheeler, a wealthy businessman from Tulsa. Wheeler was shot dead in his car at Southern Hills Country Club after a game of golf. Wheeler had become involved with Bolger through the world of High Life, which Bolger was skimming money from. Suspecting foul play, Wheeler was growing increasingly concerned for his safety in the months leading up to his murder. The hit was carried out by Johnny Martorano, a hitman associated with Bolger. The article also touched on the 2022 PGA Championship hosted at Southern Hills and the long-lasting impact of Wheeler's murder on the community and the club. And in conclusion, while the legacy of the and pain of Roger Wheeler's death continues to linger, life at Southern Hills Country Club goes on. On May 7th, 2021, an article discussed the enduring mystery of Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance 46 years prior. Hoffa, a prominent union leader with alleged mob connections, vanished after heading to a meeting with mob contacts at the Marcus Red Fox restaurant in suburban Detroit. He was declared legally dead in 1982, but his final resting place remained unknown, fueling decades of speculation and rumors. Former mob lawyer Reginald Bubba Pulp Jr. claimed to have new information on the case, suggesting that Hoffa is not hiding overseas or submerged in a body of water, but rather buried beneath a green at Savannah Inn and Golf Country Club in Georgia. This location off the coast of Georgia on Wilmington Island was once managed by Chicago mobster Lou Rosanova, a former client of Bubba's. Bubba recounted a story in which Rosanova, while playing golf, pointed out a specific location on the course where Hoffa's body was supposedly buried. Transported there in a Beechcraft King airplane from Detroit, this particular spot on the golf course was, according to Bubba, a location where mobsters and teamsters would urinate, potentially as a form of an inside joke. David Days Jr., a longtime caddy master at the club, also suggested that something unusual had occurred around the time of Hoffa's disappearance, although he could not provide specific details. The article also concluded that over four decades, the resting place of Jimmy Hoffa may have been disrespectfully used as an impromptu urinal. Impromptu urinal. What a great way to wrap up this show. Well, it's a great band name, too. Listen, thanks everyone for tuning in. You've just listened to a bonus episode of Did I Tell You About My Albatross. We hope everyone out there has a safe Halloween. Look out for our next episode, which will be rolling out later this week. Did I tell you about my albatross? Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Don't miss out on our upcoming golf giveaways and experiences. They're exclusive to our subscribers, and all you got to do is subscribe. And until next time, golf's easy. Think fairways and greens. Oh, here we go. Come on. Did I tell you about my albatross? Hey, yo.